Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny podcast. This is Steve Spector, your host, and of course, with me today is Rob Hirschfeld. Good morning, Rob. David, how are you? Good morning. I'm doing good, and hopefully you're okay. We know you went to the dentist this morning, so we're giving extra insight to our listeners <laughs> on Rob's clean schedule. Bill of, clean, clean bill of health, everything. No, no cavities. I'm proud of you. So you can go get a lollipop, I think, is the way it used to work. And uh, with us is a fantastic guest and beyond professional podcaster from the Cloudcast. We have Aaron Delp, who's the Director of Technical Solutions at Cohesity. Aaron, welcome. Hey, Stephen. Hey, Rob. How are y'all? And, and Rob, so I have to ask, was, was laughing gas involved? Did you get any good stuff with the dentist? What's... <laughs> no, sadly. They, they do tell some corny jokes, so but nothing, <laughs> nothing like that. And, and no Krispy Kreme donuts at the end. Uh, what? Well, Aaron, I would think we'd get some pretty strange conversations today if they did laughing gas with Rob. Oh, absolutely. That, that would, this would have been a one, one for the ages if we did. But <laughs> go ahead. That's funny. So, Aaron, uh, you know, you just joined Cohesity, and I know when you switched over to them, I reached out to you, and I, I'm really glad that you're able to join us. So give us just a quick background on yourself and maybe a little about, about Cohesity for our listeners who don't know, and then we'll jump into a variety of topics. Yeah, so... First of all, um, who am I? Um, so I've, you know, the day job, right? There's almost two aspects of this. There's the day job and there's the side gig. Um, the day job has been running solutions teams at, at startups or companies that kind of sort of were startups. So, you know, starting at VCE, that's why I say kind of sort of a startup. You know, it was an incredibly well-funded startup. Um, always doing solutions, though. So I've always been in technical marketing, technical solutions, and and kind of that intersection of product management, product marketing, field sales, getting involved in creating the collateral and creating the solutions and talking to customers has been kind of my day job in leading and building those teams. When it comes to Cohesity, what is Cohesity? Um, the easiest way that I have to look at that is, you know, the, the tagline is, is hyper-converged secondary storage, and it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, but what does that mean? It, it, for me, it is a fundamental building block of a modern data center, and that's a topic I'd like to go into later, and let's save that for now. But it is all about storing data and then doing things with that data. How do you find the needle in the haystack? How do you protect it? How do you encrypt it? How do you um, transport it to public cloud or another safe location? So it's all about manipulating data is the, the, the core mission of Cohesity. And then there's the side gig. The side gig, of course, is the Cloudcast. Um, the Cloudcast is seven years and running, and gosh, I don't even know how many episodes. We published another one this morning, 340-ish um, over the last seven years, and, and really talking about cloud computing, but IoT, serverless, you know, kind of honestly, whatever interests us and our listeners. Yeah, the cloud, Cloudcast is a staple, and, um worth going back and you've been the thing i love about what you've done is you've been talking to people for so long uh and i yeah i've been on a guest i was i think an early guest you yes know. you were yep um and you can you can track now people's trajectories <laughs> over uh you know what they're doing and how they're doing it i think if you went back to mine you'd be like he's still doing hardware uh, but. Right. Right. Yeah. Well and, and not just that you know like the, the one we published this morning actually had two guests on previously with two different companies they both left started other companies together and now we're on the show together and so we have multiple guests with multiple it's weird to see the network of people kind of grow and shift in the industry and also watch people's careers grow and right. shift over time as well that's the beauty of getting good guests which we're hoping to replicate by having you so well, thank you thank you and it's fun to turn the tables on somebody who's podcasting because you know you you have the benefit of hearing a whole bunch of conversations, um, and yet you're also doing. Um, you know you you know, you're, you're out of solid fire, um, and you know they had that interesting run through OpenStack and, and understanding the importance of data for OpenStack, um, and then NetApp you know un learned that value from them pretty well. Um, you know. You know, I've I've done some some podcast some some posts thinking about this data side of the data center, um, and that's your specialty. I, how you know 
Can you can you go into how the data center is becoming a data center again? Yeah, yeah. So so th okay. Th first of all, there's two aspects to think about this. There's the infrastructure, and then there, there's the applications. And so um, I'm gonna uh, um, talk about the infrastructure for a second, um, and then we can go into applications in a little while. So so. Think of infrastructure um, just like anything else in our industry. There's been some trends, right? And and data centers look different over time, right? So you had the mainframe way back, and then you had mid-range, and then you had client server, and you on on bare metal, and then we had virtualization, and then we you know had had kind of the OpenStack cloud management platforms kind of phase, and then we had containers, and now we have serverless. And you know the the big thing there though over all of it is. At the end of the day, you have to manage applications and you have to manage data and you have to do it within that infrastructure. And so what you're seeing right now is, is a shift in our industry of the data center from an infrastructure standpoint used to look of who is your server vendor, who is your network network vendor, who is your storage vendor, and then who is your virtualization vendor. And oh, by the way, 90% you know, of the time it was VMware. And that's where you had vBlocks and FlexPods and this convergence of, of the data center. Well, now it's more moving about, I just need a platform to run apps. This is where you have hyper-converged and some of these other things. And think of it as you know, the primary place in the data center, you're running things. Well, but you also have a lot of data. And you have to you know, protect that data. You want to be able to store it for a large amount of time. You want to be able to do analytics against it, you know, big data, data lakes, all of these kind of buzzwords. And then you want to be able to put it out in the cloud. And so there's almost like instead of the three building blocks being server, storage, and networking, the three building blocks become applications, data, and cloud. And so that is the big transformation we're seeing in both a lot of the Cloudcast guests as well as customers I interact with on, on, on a day-to-day -day basis. So, so do you think the conversation is, is sort of, you know, we're, we're dropping infrastructure as a pillar. I mean, it's still there. And, and right, server, the, the whole serverless still has servers thing is, is yes. We know that. <laughs> right, right. I, and, I mean, right, and that's, that's my, that, that's, <laughs> that can be your daily bread. That's great. The, the market, though, is moving to transforming data is the, right, that, that's what you're really talking about, it's a data transform. Yeah, completely. And so, and, and think about it uh, maybe another way as well, because you brought up serverless, I, I'm going to, you know, pick on it slightly for a little bit, but also evangelize it all at the same time. So maybe this will be the ultimate backhanded compliment to, to serving. <laughs> um, so again, you know, think of everything as a, as a long-term journey. And if I put mainframe all the way on, on the left and serverless all the way on the right, not just from a time standpoint, but think of it as a, a decoupling that happens, right? You, you know, going from a big monolith, monolithic application and a big monolithic infrastructure all the way to completely decoupled. But the, the backhanded complement portion of all of this is great. I've done all of this. I now can go faster. I can do CI, CD. I can do all of these awesome things from an operation standpoint. But the flip side is the complexity to operations that it introduces. I now have to do versioning control at the function level. I have to do all of these things of how do all of these services and functions interact with each other. So I've become more agile and more flexible, but at the cost of complexity. And that's something a lot of people, you know, when they say, oh, serverless is going to replace containers. Containers was going to replace virtualization. Virtualization, <laughs> you know, when you just, you, you keep going down the line of the, everyone was going to replace the previous one. No, it's an additional tool in the toolbox. I, and I, I think, you know, I think that's a good way to look at it. Um, although it is, you know, it's a higher abstraction. Right, you're not making exactly. things below go away. Although I, you know, I'll put in a pitch for that. Doesn't mean that you're getting further from the infrastructure. I, you know, complexity is the enemy uh, for operations. And so, you know, if you have a pipeline that's doing version functions and you can deliver into a platform that's doing serverless, you might not need to put that serverless platform on containers, on VMs, on metal. <laughs> right, right. You, you right. might be able to to hide. You know that that abstraction becomes the only abstraction you need. Um, exactly. And yes, and 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 what's what's for, for me the interesting part there from a solution standpoint. Like I always put on my solutions architect hat, and and for me, 
no matter what it is, everything's a big jigsaw puzzle. And, and do, you know, how and when do the pieces all fit together to, to form that puzzle or that solution? And all it is, is it's, it's more pieces and it's more ways you can mix and match what you need to get to the end goal. And right. that amount of flexibility in choosing the tools you need to create your solution I'm always for that. The more tools, the better. The more ways to solve the problem, the better, right? And it keeps all, it keeps all the architects in business because now you have more things. To, the ultimate answer is like anybody goes, well, is it this? And you go, well, it depends, right? And, and, and so there's more variables to the it depends answer this way. <laughs> I, I agree with you. The, day, the days of, it, of everything having to be a Java stack or a Python stack hopefully are, are going, going down um, a bit and, and we're, we're a little bit more flexible about tools. And I, I do think, you know, that reinforces what I see as a broader IT trend, which is the world being a best of breed world. Um, yes. Where you, you don't go to one vendor and think that they're going to supply every piece of the puzzle for you. Um, the, you know, the Microsoft and Oracle days of the 90s is sort of what I'm, I'm thinking. Yeah, right, right, right. Although they are still trying, without a doubt, with the stacks, right? Well, um, I was just going to say that. The, the vendor, <laughs> there's a lot of vendors who still think they could do that. So. Yeah, right, right. It, it, but it, it, Amazon's, it, Amazon's swinging for the fence in that, in that regard. Yeah, well, and, and but so you bring up a great point there and another, you know, I'm kind of trying to hit on all of these kind of trends that I've been seeing, right? So think of it this way. What is the infrastructure replacement trend? You know, on, on historically on servers, it was like three years, you know, storage, maybe it was like five to seven years. And you always had this, okay, I'm on a refresh cycle, right? And, and all of the big accounts and all of the big vendors in the industry, you know, for the, the customers, whether they knew it or not, they knew when that refresh cycle was up and they knew when to hit you back up. Um, yes. But, but, but what happened is the applications on top of all of that infrastructure never match that. You didn't have an application typically with a three to five year life cycle. An application had a seven to 10 year life cycle and, and sometimes even longer. So, you know, I'm going to severely date myself for a second. Um, my first job out of college um, was working for IBM Global Services data center operations. Um, we actually came into client server. So when I first started there, they were developing the client server environment. The environment previous to that was IBM Series 1. And I don't expect anyone to know what IBM Series 1 is, but let's just put it this way. 1970s technology, um, and it was for a large photo finishing uh, company that everyone would be a household name, but I'm not going to name them. And, and you know, they didn't see digital coming and 35 millimeter film photo finishing was like the, the thing and it was gonna be that way forever. And so everything was running on the Series 1, billing, shipping, everything. Well. Guess what happens? You know, we're moving along. Everything's getting outdated. 35 millimeter film photo finishing is going away. We reached the point where as far as we knew, there was only two production systems left in the world on IBM Series 1. Us and NASA running the space shuttle. <laughs> Okay. And the <laughs> only, but right. yeah. and, and, but, well, yes and no, because at the, at the time, the only way we could get parts, because they hadn't even made the parts in however many years, we would have to go onto eBay and bid on IBM Series 1 parts, and we were bidding against NASA for those parts. <laughs> and then we had an entire warehouse of like, anytime a part went up, we would buy it and we would stockpile it. So when something failed, we could replace it. But the, the, the whole point there was that application lasted 25 years right and and so you know until the business has a need to replace something and a driver to replace something now, now don't give your own application life cycles have come a long way since then and that is the whole point of a lot of this is this ability to move faster and to be decoupled from the hardware platform and so that is an extreme example of where we've been Versus That's an interesting the, point, right? Because the, the part of your challenge was that it was coupled to a, hard, a specific hardware platform. And, yes. and we've, we've come a long way in decoupling um, applications, you know, not just from the hardware itself, but from the operating system that it's running on, from the language stack that it's running on, right? This network-bound network, network bound microservices, um, you can completely patchwork together an application out of anything. Yes. That is correct. Um, and, and then note to users, test it, 
validate it, continuously <laughs> integrate it, right? Service mesh it so that you have A-B testing and do all the right stuff. Uh, so, I, boy, there's a couple of places where I'm really interested to go. Um, you know, as a nod to your current job, it, you know, is there a, you know, your cohesities in the data um, space, you know, trying to figure out how to, how to position and help people with data. Is there a, you know, we were sort of talking around this piece, is there a component where data and these new abstractions play well together? Yeah, the, think of it this way. Um, so, if it, you know, again, if I go back to those building blocks, right, if I have um, a place to run my applications, whether it's virtualization, whether it's, you know, on an HCI platform, something like that, and I kind of put that at the top, at the end HCI of the day, being hyper-converged infrastructure. That is yeah. correct. Hey, sorry, HCI. Hyper infrastructure. <laughs> Don't want to assume anything, right? And and but then, yeah, they, for us, it is all about protecting that data, tiering that data, doing all of the things that you need to do. That again, maybe a, you know, a, a, another disruption story, kind of like my my IBM Series One days, a right. disruption story of legacy backup. And, and so the, you know, I was an, I, again, going back to that same thing, as we evolved, I actually was an IBM TSM admin with the, which, a, you know, it's, which is the Tivoli storage manager with the, with a big tape library. And we had to change tapes and do all these other things. And, you know, no one ever was like, oh gosh, I love my backups. Or I know for a fact my, you know, my, uh, gosh, disaster recovery has been, you know, tested. It is really, Everyone always hated that, that portion of the job. Right. And so for us, it is all about how do you modernize another aspect of the data center and, and the data portion of the data center specifically. So, so one, one of the things that strikes me as super confusing, and we talk a lot about edge infrastructure here, and, and this sort of bleeds into this, is where is my data? Where are the copies of my data? How do I synchronize and store my data? Um, because we're, you know, if you just put everything in US East 1, you know, US West 2, <laughs> yay, it's, it's there. But, but that is not a very good strategy. Yes. Um, and, and we're hearing pretty clearly that it's market-wise. Companies have data in multiple places. They want data in multiple places. Edge is going to drive data into the place where latency dictates it needs to be. Can, you know, that, I, I just laid out a huge evolving landscape. Yep. I, you help illustrate that? Can you give us some insight? Yeah. And, well, first of all, so, so I'm going to actually, for those that are super, super interested in the challenges of it, I know you've talked about it extensively on the podcast mm -hmm. before, but, but we recently did a, a podcast uh, a month or two ago over at the podcast, but it was IoT and Edge for a, a company that actually is in the ag space. Mm -hmm. And it was super interesting because when they laid out the problem, they laid out the problem exactly like you're talking about of the biggest issue they have in the ag space is, is bandwidth and latency. And so it requires edge because you don't have the time to get it back to, you know, to core, if you will, and process and get the data back. The round trip is just, you can't do that as well as, Again, think of a you know a, an agriculture environment, a, an extremely rigorous, tough environment, and the the devices have to be rock solid. The devices have to be stable. The devices have to have protection from the element elements, and so there's all these aspects to edge that in you know that seems like a perfect use case to help illustrate the why of edge. Right, I, and, and that, then, that that's where hmm. that to me gets interesting. By the way, that's that's episode three three seven. There you go. There you go. And, and, and so what, what, and then to take it one step further, edge more and more is going to require some kind of, of specialization in the, at the computing level. And I'll, yeah, another, for instance, right, our phones, um, the, the latest phones, whether it's Android or, or Apple, you're starting to see specialized chips, specialized, you know, in the Apple case, it's the mm -hmm. face ID. Right, you're starting to see chips that have onboard processing for very specialized roles, and that is in in many ways an edge case solution. Right. Um, and and you know it's processing data very very quickly at the edge, but then at the same time getting it back, long hauling it back to core, 
at some point in the future for the data that needs that long haul and protection. Correct. And, and, but, I, but I would expect, right, latency is, a, is a, in my edge conversations and what I'm hearing, late, you know, we're starting to hone in on, it's all about latency. Yep. Um, <laughs> so it keeps it simple. The, but, you know, this idea of long hauling it back to a, you know, a data center somewhere else, as these applications get tighter and do more analytics and need more data, we're not, that's not really an option. We can't keep long hauling. Um, we have, we're going to have to have some regional uh, data center that, that can provide you with some, some aggregation of all your data points. Uh, yes. And, and, and what's interesting there is I, I, you know, and again, you know, my gut tells me, um, that that is probably, you know, again, is the next evolution, right? As, or, or the next big thing, um, as we kind of continue to decentralize the data center, that is the next step in the decentralization of this architecture is it, it doesn't become data center, it becomes data centers, or it becomes, yeah. you know, edge data centers, or, you know, there's some new terminology or new technology that isn't even necessarily invented or mature yet as the next step. So there, there's, a, there's a huge metadata data problem, forgive my, my double datas, um, in that what, when we describe thousands or millions of data centers with, with highly localized data, they're not clones of, of the universal data set. They have, you have to have something that's smart enough to regionalize local, uh, actually localize and personalize the data caches for the applications that are running locally or the people that are running their, their own, you know, their phones, what data do you want to, you want to, you, you know, sort of follow you around through, through the universe. Um, do you see applications emerging with, with this type of, 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 you know, locality awareness? I, I do, and but so the, there's there's the larger problem of signal to noise, okay. um, and, and and think of it this way: um, just because I'm collecting all the data doesn't necessarily always mean I should be collecting all the data. Um, you know, t telemetry of vehicles comes to mind, and you know, of cars, mm -hmm. of of tractors in the ag space, of planes. You know, you hear about generating just petabytes of data uh, in these spaces, and you may need that at some point. But how much of that is signal and the things you really, really need that needle in the haystack, and how much of it is noise, and that actually I, I see as another trend that we will see of um, an explosion of the data. And, and, you know, I don't want to overuse the terms and say big data and AI and machine learning and data lakes. And, you know, I can throw out all the buzzwords, <laughs> but, but we, can, we can play the buzzword bingo game. But at but the end of the day, the, the end result we're looking for is how do I find the needle in the haystack when I need to find it? And that actually becomes the much harder problem and the metadata data <laughs> that right. problem that you're referring to. And, and this is where I, the trend I, I, I anticipate, I'm interested in your take on, is that that's going to end up being machine edge machine learning, edge infrastructure machine learning. Yes. Um, too big a problem for your phone but you, you don't want to backhaul everything. You don't know what it is. I think needle in the haystack is exactly the right, right way. You have to figure out a way to get smarter as this data is ingested. Um, Agreed. Yeah, because it's all about, you know, of course, yeah, if latent, going back to your, if latency is the bottleneck, mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you minimize and filter out? And then, you know, hey, there's always compression, deduplication, all these other, you know, technologies across the wire that need to be applied to it as well. But, but the, the, even if you dedupe you know, de and compress something, if it's not needed, you're just wasting it. And right. so, so you want to more than anything, number one is filter it. Do I really, really want to long haul this back? And then if I do, then compress it, then dedupe it, and then haul it back. So, so I, want to, I want to throw a scenario at you and, and challenge. See, I, something I, emerging to me as a broader assumption, I want to, I want to test it with you a little bit. 
because we always seem to make the assumption that we're going long haul back to a data center or a vendor. But it feels to me like the reality is in our home, on our phone, in our desktop, it's multi-vendor. And in, in our situation, this is actually almost circular because we're gonna come back to this multi-vendor uh, best of breed thing. Your, your IoT experience is not all the AM, one data, Amazon data center. It's gonna be distributed across multiple vendors who use multiple providers, who host out of multiple, multiple centralized locations. Um, it's not as simple as, you know, oh, I don't wanna put it in, you know, US West, I wanna put it, you know, move it, move it closer to me in the, my regional pop. Um, right. What, what's right. your, you know, how, where, do you see that as a, as a, you know, this very fragmented market emerging or will it consolidate? It, so just like anything, and this goes to the larger trend of, uh, so with the, the podcast, the cloudcast, we've ridden a number of waves in the industry. So when we first started the podcast, um, it was really all about cloud stack open stack way back in the day. Right. And then you, you know, some, and, and, and all of the ecosystems and all of the startups in those spaces. And, and, and then that one kind of matured out and, and, you know, everyone got bought and that's, you know, when you, when you saw a lot of the companies kind of get absorbed into the larger vendors or, you know, unfortunately in some cases uh, run out of funding. Um, and then we moved into the DevOps and, and container wave and we had all of those and you, with every, every wave you get one or two shining stars. You get a couple of okay exits and you get a couple of losers and that's just the nature of emerging tech and, and each wave. Um, and so you've got a you know, broad fragmentation to start in a consolidation over time. And I see that happening in this space as well, but unfortunately, the the flip side to it is is a lot of these other spaces. We've seen a lot of VC funding and a lot of your very typical seed round, A round, B round, C round, and and going through your your typical VC funding scenarios and strategies, and then ultimately with some kind of exit. But what I've noticed is with serverless and with IoT and edge from an infrastructure standpoint, that market never evolved. What happened is you had Azure, you had uh, GCP, Google Cloud, mm -hmm. you had AWS seal up those markets super early. So what happens is the infrastructure or that backhaul, if you will, is already solidified. But the, the, the uh, VCs and the startups now are in the edge are in AI are in all of these spaces. And so what you're doing is the, is when we would say, Oh, at the beginning of the podcast, a lot of the VCs were infrastructure based startups. We're now moving to a phase where all of the VCs and a lot of the funding we're seeing is IOT edge serverless kind of technologies as well. And that, that makes a lot of sense. I, I think that, we, we need to figure out how we deploy multi-tenant, highly distributed applications, and the tech is not there. Um, you know, the, the problem, and the reason why I love talking to you about this problem at this, at this point is data is the, the, ch the first challenge, right? Building a Lambda on an edge infrastructure is, it's, it's not that hard to imagine. It's, it's I'm not gonna trivialize the effort, but, what are the events? Where are they coming from? How do they get the right data? Right? How, you know, that's a, that's not a problem that Amazon has solved yet or needs to solve, frankly. Um, so that we're, we're, we're talking around this, this really core problem that's different than anything else. It, it is. Um, and think of it this way too. Um, you know, I'll bring in another trend, and I know we wanted to talk about it, so I'm just going to bring it in now. And, and another trend uh, with, the, you know, the VC fundings and the startups was, was open source for, for ah, years. Thank you. And, <laughs> That's and, where I was going next. <laughs> and, and, don't, and don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not saying that is a trend that is going away. It's not, first of all. But there is, there is a, 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 uh, one thing to examine before we, we do the larger things. And so open source has been good for customers. 
without a doubt. That is just, that's not even up for argument. But I would actually say in watching this space and talking to, to startups for, for, you know, going on years now, is open source good for vendors at times? And the reason why I say that is because yeah. it's a double-edged sword. It is a double-edged sword in order to raise awareness of your company, in order to get adoption of your products. Um, there was a, an extremely large number of startups that, that went the open source route to land and expand as quickly as they could. And Correct. that made perfect sense. But then when it came time to flip the switch and, and how do we monetize this, that's where a lot of companies have historically struggled. And that is why still to this day, you can count the number of successful multi-million dollar open source companies on one hand and maybe even have some fingers left over. Um, I I share, I share your assessment of the market, but I, I, the one thing I might question is, and we should come back to is I'm not sure it's been that good for the, the users. Um, I, 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 I would say it has in that it allows everyone to get started extremely quickly. And if the company is willing to do it, build the expertise in house and control their own destiny, much better than you ever could in a, you know, a quote unquote closed source model. And so I feel like the benefits are there and established. Now, again, with great power comes great responsibility. Um, there is a complexity argument at times, but, but I, I think the, the open source model will continue to grow and will continue adoption within the industry from the customer standpoint. But the vendors will just continue to struggle with with the making making the money portion of the side. And I'm gonna, you know, I'll be I'll be honest. I, and I don't know, uh, you know, I, I know you had John Willis and some of the others on in the past. I don't want to yeah. uh, call anybody out here uh, for the past, but you know, I'm gonna pick on Docker for a second. Um, <laughs> and John talks in in that Don and I talked about open source and Docker specifically. So check out that podcast. You can hear John's opinions there. It's not as simple as you think. Right. I want to hear yours. Yeah. And, and, and so, so here's, here's, you know, for better or worse, Docker will go down in history as one of the examples of not, um, gosh, I hesitate to use the term respecting, but I'm going to say respecting the community. Um, they okay. rolled out the model. They had massive adoption. And then they realized it's time to flip the switch. And they probably hadn't thought it through how to flip that switch accurately. I, I want to ask you, because I, I, I want to distinguish between ecosystem and community here. Yes. Because, because I, there's a lot of people who are avid. They would consider themselves in the Docker community. And Docker has a, a fan base, still has a, a, a big fan base for people in what I would consider their user community. Or yep. maybe their developer community. Yep. Do, are you are you thinking that? Because well, I, I think yeah. of vendor of them as misstepping yeah. their ecosystem. Yep. I, so I would more. say the the care and feeding of that ecosystem. You know, we you know, Brian and I used to say on the podcast, you know, Big D Docker the company and mm -hmm. Little D Docker the you know the project, right? Um, the care and feeding of Little D. Um, was at times I feel there was missteps that happened to try and monetize big D Docker. And sure. so for me, that, that is one of those things of, uh, you know, it, it had just this amazing adoption, but then let's, you know, let's be completely honest. Other things came along in the industry that had less friction and um, had a better track record and have since, you know, kind of eclipsed them. That's not to say they're going away. They're not, um, or at least not in the near term. But there is, you know, a, a, it will go down in history as kind of one of the really, really big ones that's worth studying as a cautionary tale, if I use that. Yeah, term. I, I agree with you. I, I think you, you have to look at the adoption curve and then, and then try and, you know, there's a, books should be written about why, they couldn't couldn't turn that adoption curve into um, a Red Hat um, on the other side, and in part they couldn't because of Red Hat. Um, yes. <laughs> Fair uh, enough. I mean, Absolutely. Red Hat Red Hat uh, appropriately rolled in with with their 
version of open source tanks, turrets, uh, and, uh, and, and fences. Yep. Um, and, you know, and, you know, that, that sounds sort of mil very military and aggressive. I, I think this is part of how things go, but part of it's, I think that we don't have a very good monetization story. Um, and, and well, and asked, let me add this though. Yeah. It, it's also, um, for folks out there that have read crossing the chasm, mm -hmm. It is a classic, classic, classic crossing the, crossing the chasm story. And, and so for those that aren't familiar with it, you, you think of it that you've got a curve um, and a you know, standard bell curve, but on the left-hand side, there's a little chunk missing out of the middle of it and there's a big chasm in it. But how, does, how do technologies get adopted today? You get the, the tech enthusiasts um, who really, they wanna play with everything because it's the latest and greatest. And then they go, oh, wow, this is cool. This solves a problem. And it's a lot of, you know, solutions architects that are out there that just love to play with the newest tech. And that moves into the early adopter stage of the tech enthusiasts talk to the early adopters. The early adopters go, yes, this actually solves a problem in my business. I want to go ahead and adopt this. And you start to, you know, everything starts to creep up the curve. Well, then you've got this big chasm between early adopters and the middle of the market and the late to market, if you will. And the reason why is because the further up the curve you get, the more conservative you get, and the more so being a startup, it, it, it becomes a detriment instead of an advantage. Those early adopters and the tech enthusiasts, they prefer startups. They don't prefer the old stodgy companies, but the, <laughs> the middle to late, they like the comfort and convenience of a name they know and trust and a name they know will be around in five years. We know Red Hat will be around in five years. And so right. what happens is you get so far up on the curve but if you can't successfully jump across the chasm, somebody else who is, who is bigger and a more of a household name and has more confidence in the brand actually displaces you. And sometimes it's not due to tech and that's unfortunately the nature of our business. Well, but, but this, is, this is where I've been struggling with open source. I'm interested in, in your, your opinion on this. And you're, you're, you're talking around it. I have a different way of, of saying something similar. Open source does a really good job of giving you a new thing and if you don't like it, giving you a new thing. And, and companies that monetize things need an economy of scale where there's a repeatable pattern and process behind the scenes that they are making more efficient. And so they need their customers to really start following standard patterns and practices and, and sustaining it. And, yes. and what, what, I, what I see as a challenge from an open source model is sustaining engineering making incremental changes, doing upgrades and patches and making sure you don't break things going backwards and making sure that, that when the next customer comes online, they do it in a consistent way so you don't have to support two of something. Those are commercial, there's a commercial driver to make that happen. Yes, and I will add this. Okay. You, usually the commercial driver is needed to do the boring work. The, 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 the folks that are first in like to do, you know, like the, no one wants to do the sustaining engineering unless I'm paid to do it. Like it, it's, you know, you don't have a, no, no, I shouldn't say you don't. It's the rare exception. You have somebody who loves to do bug fixes of boring code in their free time. They, <laughs> they like to work on the new. And, and, and so what happens is you get, I want to go develop the, the latest shiny and I want, but I don't want to write documentation. I don't want to do sustaining engineering. Well, that is where these other companies come in if they provide the sustaining engineering. Oh, you want to call support. Okay. Well, you, you have to staff support, right? There is paychecks and careers and, and day jobs at stake over the sustaining portion of this right. model. And it, lots of folks don't consider the, the breadth of what it takes to sustain something versus that first you know, product out the door. Well, and it's also, nobody else cares about your operational problem. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, I, I, you know, and, and I saw this happen, I see this happen in all the open source communities. It's like, and, and like I'm trying to help Kubernetes have an operators community. And part of the problem is every operators problem is a snowflake. And so it takes a lot of emotional um, an intellectual investment to understand somebody else's environment enough so that you can help them. Um, 
And that's a pay act. I mean, that's, that's therapy. <laughs> right, right, right. And well, um, and there's also a certain amount of, so I'll, I'll, I'm going to flip that on its head for just one second and say, but it also can be solved through a, a certain amount of technology. So I'll bring up another example from my past and you had mentioned it earlier. So, you know, uh, previous to this, I worked for a company, Solid Fire. If you're not familiar with it, it was scale out storage, um, scale out block storage specifically. And one of the bread and butter features we had was OpenStack integration. Um, and th there was, uh, you know, a, a, at this point, decently famous person at the time, John Griffith, who was our main. Still famous. We love John. Exactly. Exactly. Lead for, you know, PTL for the Cinder project. And, and, but, but he was a thought leader in how to do integrations and really be able to do integrations at scale. And so what we actually did is we were able to build into the product and take into account a lot of those scenarios. So it is possible to, to build the framework to enable snowflakes, <laughs> right. um, but it is not easy. Um, and, and, and it is, it, it, I shouldn't say it isn't done well because there are ex examples of it is done extremely well, but it is the minority. A lot of and time. this, this, I mean, you, you mentioned OpenStack and that means it's time to wrap up the show. Um, but, <laughs> um, no, but, but I, I do, do I have to put, do I have to put like a quarter in the swear jar or something? Exactly. No, <laughs> no, we love OpenStack. Um, I, but I, but you know, this was one of the big debates in the community is the lack of focus on a very, on a small core made it incredibly hard to support a community of, you know, an ecosystem, and this is ecosystem yep. building around it. Um, and I think that it's very easy for an open source project, Docker is a good example, open, OpenStack, um, maybe two, of building community over ecosystem, mm -hmm. and thinking that because your community is doing great, your ecosystem is going to ma is going to magically appear around it, um, and it's much harder to build an ecosystem because sure. of these problems. Sure, and I, and I'm actually going to also expand slightly on the you know we'll use Cinder specifically here. So so you know block storage uh, project in OpenStack. What was really interesting there too is the bigger the community grew, and the more vendors it supported. Um, the greater that, that there was a certain amount of, um, I'll just say dilution of the Cinder project in that um, everyone wanted their thing supported, you know, their unique feature of their storage. And yeah. it got harder and harder uh, because, you know, you had vendor politics, you had all of these other things where the community started, started to show signs of stress of, well, if you do that, that will break my thing. And yeah, you know, the more vendors there was, the more agreement and the more consensus you had to have. And you know, the scaling of communities, I would add, and the effective scaling of communities is an even bigger challenge at times because it's a combination of politics and technology at that point. So I, I, I'm gonna time constrain you. Yeah. But, but with Cohesity, you're building open source, Cohesity is proprietary, you're doing sort of the, you have control on the base. Open yes. source, does, how does open source help you in that story? Yeah, so for us, and again, you know, they, they, they brought me in to kind of help build up the solutions team and the solutions ecosystem. For us, it will be, and actually it's, it's the exact same thing. We had at SolidFire as well, of there will be a community around solutions. So, and, and how do I define solutions? Solutions is, Cohesity with something, right? Cohesity with, in this instance, you know, pick your um, project or you know uh, integration point of of choice, and and then publishing those integration points. Uh, how how do we interact with the REST API to get the results we need? And so it is it is going to be more about publishing scripts and publishing enabling folks to build solutions and start to have a community around building solutions uh, rather than uh, you know, the core product itself. And that, that makes sense. So you, get, you have control to provide the, the uh, efficiencies of scale or the customer experience, and then you, you, you create visibility so that as people snowflake, that you don't have to try and absorb their snowflakes. Open, the open 
source piece sort of becomes a snowflaking zone. Exactly. It, it becomes for us an enabler, right? For what we want to do is, is enable as many different configurations and as many different solutions as possible in the market. Because again, we are a startup and we understand also the, the power of that scale that can happen. And that's what we want to ultimately enable. We want to give everyone the tools to go build their own solutions. Yeah, this is, there's, a, there's a, a dilemma here that we don't have time to go into, I, I wish we did, which is the Ansible Galaxy dilemma of, right, you have a million of the same thing with just enough variation that people can't collaborate. Um, yeah, the, the, the idea of what is the minimum viable platform <laughs> or what is the minimum viable solution of what do you publish that is usable and, and what can you take and you know, it's the 80, 20 rule, right? Like we want to put something out there that is 80% finished or 80% standardized and then you go the last 20%. So that is ultimately the goal here because obviously if you have to build the same thing a lot of our other customers have to build, then we should have just done that, right? It should only be the customized and unique bits are what you need to do. And that's, that's our goal. I, but I admit this is, this is a journey. We're on a journey just like a lot of other folks in the industry. So Aaron, uh, that was good conversation. I enjoyed it. And I know it's always a great podcast when we get to where I come in and, and I can think Rob has 15 more questions. <laughs> and, and, and we just, I feel like we just got it, got started, but um, no, it was really great. And I apologize to everyone, but we do have hard stops and, and we do try to keep these things under around 40, 45 minutes. Otherwise we'd have three hour podcasts and that would take me a long time to process. Uh, Aaron, thanks again for joining us. If guests uh, listening want to reach out to you, any best ways, uh, social media, any place you want to send them? Yeah, absolutely. The, the easiest way is on Twitter. It's just at Aaron Delp, A-A-R-O-N-D-E-L-P. Uh, the Cloudcast is at the Cloudcast net, uh, excuse me, at the Cloudcast.net. Um, and then for us, you know, the day job as well, um, we're always hiring. Uh, DMs are open on Twitter um, and, you know, cohesity.com. And then there's a job section as well. So that's a little bit of uh, both day job and side jobs. Perfect. Well, Aaron, thank you. And Rob, uh, I, thanks again. Um, I appreciate it. And to our listeners, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. And uh, we look forward to talking to you next time. Thanks, everyone.